I can't. I gotta wait for the boss. <laughs> Welcome to Grand Rounds and our ninth annual Family Literacy Day celebrations. For your information, the Montreal Children's Hospital has several literacy programs, including Books for Babies in the NICU, Lear Imagine Read in six pediatrics clinics, which follows the recommendations of literacy promotion by pediatricians, and Biblio Express on the wards. Every January, we also join early childhood groups from across Canada in celebrating Family Literacy Day. Behind me, you see a PowerPoint slideshow of the events from the past created by Jan Larivière. Please join us today from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. in the 2B clinic area to visit some of the community literacy organizations we work with. Free books are also available for patients and parents. Please invite all of your patients and their parents to join our Family Literacy Day celebrations in the 2B clinic area. I'm honored to introduce our very own Dr. Carolyn Erdos as our guest speaker today at our last Literacy Grand Rounds before the move to the Glen. Dr. Erdos has been a speech-language pathologist at the Montreal Children's Hospital since 1996. Her areas of expertise include bilingualism, multilingualism, reading impairment, oral language impairment, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and craniofacial disorders. Dr. Erdos also works in a trilingual school and has worked as a legal expert in the field of speech-language pathology. In 2011, she obtained her PhD from McGill University. The topic of her dissertation was predicting oral language and literacy outcomes of elementary students in French immersion programs. Dr. Erdos and her husband have two sons. They are exposed to two languages and at home and three languages at school. Please welcome Dr. Carolyn Erdos. Thank you, good morning. I'm really excited to see all this enthusiasm for bilingualism, thanks for being here. Before I start, I'd like to say that while I will be presenting research mostly or uniquely on bilingual children, I know that you all have cases in mind or um, your own children who may be exposed to more than two languages. And what I'd like to say about that is that while there is much less research about children who speak three or more languages, the research that does exist will um, give us the general guidelines that I'm presenting today about bilingualism. So firstly, just um, to know you a little bit, how many people here speak two languages fluently? Wow, very good. And three languages fluently? Oh, very nice. More than three? Okay, we've reached our limit, but still very impressive. I'm always impressed with the multilingualism here at the Children's. I'm so proud of it. So as we saw here, worldwide, there are more individuals who speak two or more languages than individuals who speak one language. So really, the norm then is to be multilingual, not monolingual. And there is a growing need to be bilingual and multilingual. With globalization, we are increasingly communicating with, on a daily basis with individuals from other countries or who speak other languages. Think of the internet. Many years ago, there was mostly English only on the internet. Now, you can find every language imaginable. And as an interesting fact, we now, for the first time, have more second language speakers of English than native speakers of English. So it's rising and there's no end in sight. And the fact that there are so many individuals who speak two or more languages is great news because there is quite a bit of evidence showing that bilingual individuals, uh, when you reach a high level of bilingualism, there are numerous cognitive advantages that are associated with that. These advantages tend to fall into two domains. The first one is in the domain of controlled selective attention. So studies show that bilingual individuals are better at focusing on certain specific information at ignoring irrelevant information. So we're good at multitasking. We're good at problem solving. 
The other area that's advantaged is metalinguistic awareness, and that's the ability to reflect upon and manipulate linguistic information. It's not surprising that metalinguistic awareness is very useful when you're learning languages. Another interesting finding uh, in the area of bilingual research that I find particularly interesting is that in individuals who are predisposed to develop dementia, we know that bilingual individuals, on average, will develop the first signs of dementia five to six years later than monolingual individuals. So it's all good news. And the reason why we think these advantages are happening is because bilingual individuals have to constantly juggle these two languages, and it's this constant work that would help us acquire these cognitive advantages. I also have a little picture here, a reversible picture, where you could either see the mouse or the elderly person. And that's just to show that there was a study demonstrating that bilingual individuals will more easily see both pictures in this reversible image. So no one would argue that bilingualism is a good thing, but we tend to draw the line when children have language difficulty. And it's still very much a trend for professionals, speech language pathologists, psychologists, doctors, neighbors, teachers, cousins, to recommend that we limit a child's exposure to languages if the child is showing any signs of language delay or language impairment. But we really have to look at whether this is true. And I understand why people are saying it, because the idea behind it is, well, it must be better to have more exposure to a language. And if one language is difficult, well, surely two languages is even more difficult. We have to really look at that more closely. And we have to consider the ramifications of making that recommendation. Both at home and at school, there can be negative repercussions of that recommendation. At home, you can create a situation where the quality of the personal exchanges between family members is affected. And this is very subtle, but children pick up on it. As a personal story, my own boys have both at separate times in their lives indicated to me that I'm really not as nice when I speak French as when I speak English. Because in English, I'll be like, honey, lovey-dovey, you know, your room's a little messy. Do you think you can clean it up? And in French, I'll be like, c'est ni You know, I don't have all these little terms. And <laughs> I just don't, I'm fluent in French, but I, I don't have those cute rhymesy terms that I have in English. We can also be creating a situation where the child's linguistically excluded from the family. Now, if I have family members who only speak English and we eliminate English in my household, when those family members come come over, my child will not be able to communicate with them well if we've eliminated English from his life. Um, we can have a child who feels like a failure. Why are people dumbing this down for me? Everyone speaks two languages, and then with me, they're speaking one language. We can also have a situation where a language model lacks proficiency. So if we cut um, French in my household and speak only English, my children will be getting a suboptimal model from my husband, who speaks English very well but does not master English. So these are some of the consequences. At school, if we're talking about bilingualism through schooling, we can have a situation where an English dominant child is in a French immersion program. Kindergarten grade one and grade two are mostly in French. And he's having difficulty. And the teachers think it would be helpful for this child to be pulled out of the immersion program and put into the monolingual English stream of that school board. So we pull the child out. We put him in the English stream. And the teachers notice right away that he's having difficulty. But they say, oh, well, you know, he's been schooled in French for a few years. Let's give him a chance. He's just getting in this English program, let's wait and see. So he's been identified in the French program, now we're waiting again in the English program. So a lot of precious time is going by before we're identifying the child and providing intervention. Before we can address the issue of the effect of bilingualism on children with language delay or impairment, we have to understand what happens when typically developing children are bilingual. And the story, the big picture, and uh, the details as well tell us that there are no significant differences between bilingual and monolingual children in terms of their language milestones. They will learn to segment words at the same age. They will babble at the same age. They will say their first words at the same age, two-word combinations, and so on. Whether they're exposed to two languages or to one, it makes no difference. There's not a separate set of milestones for bilingual babies. That's not to say that there are not any differences, though. There are some differences, and one main difference between bilingual and monolingual children is with respect to vocabulary. 
So we know that we, if we have a bilingual French-English child, for example, and we compare that child's French vocabulary to a monolingual French child, the bilingual child's vocabulary will be reduced as compared to the monolingual child's. And if we compare his English vocabulary to an English monolingual child, that vocabulary will be reduced. But we also know that if we look at total conceptual vocabulary, which is saying, do you have a label for this item in either one of your languages, that vocabulary is equivalent in bilingual children and monolingual children. So we have to be aware of this not to underestimate their abilities. And it's quite shocking because there are still studies being published now where they're not looking at conceptual vocabulary and they're drawing conclusions like bilingualism will delay the onset of language, blah, blah. But the issue is conceptual vocabulary is what needs to be looked at. And this is due probably to early on memory limitations. There's only so many words that a two-year-old can learn initially. It's due as well to relative exposure. I did my master's in English, so when I graduated, most of my professional vocabulary was in English. I had very little terminology in French. I picked that up from working here at the Children's in this beautiful bilingual setting. Um, and these differences persist into adulthood. They're not a sign of impairment. They're a sign of being bilingual. We also know that there are certain differences based on input. So if a child's not receiving at least 40% input in a language, we should not expect that child to perform within normal limits in terms of grammatical abilities. Again, not a sign of impairment. It's a sign of you need a certain amount of input before you um, uh, function like a monolingual child. Also, we know that children in immersion programs, so despite receiving less instruction in each of their languages than children in monolingual programs, those children perform just as well in terms of their conversational skills and their reading and writing skills in their first language. We also know that they attain um, appropriate levels of academic achievement as compared to children in monolingual programs. And they acquire second language skills that are superior to what they would acquire in the regular monolingual program, which is a few hours of second language instruction. And this is true whether we're talking about minority linguistic groups, like for example, Mohawk immersion, or um, children from low SES backgrounds. And the reason why learning two languages is not like learning one language twice is because there's a lot of transfer that occurs. So at the surface, the two languages may seem very different, but underlying all of that, there's a lot of, there are a lot of commonalities. So if you think, for example, and this happened to my own children who are schooled in French, they received reading instruction in French only, and both of them one day started reading fluently in English. So what they did there is they just applied everything they had been taught about reading in French. They read out loud. Some things sounded a little bit weird. They tweaked it a little bit, and there you go. They were reading in English. So they did not have to relearn written language skills in English. And we see this at very different levels, especially when it comes to academic skills. Everything you learn in math, everything you learn about problem solving, about story structure, that all transfers over. We do need certain basic requirements to become bilingual. We need rich language input. We need opportunities to use the language both formally and informally. As those of you who travel in countries that speak Spanish know, you know, it's not enough to be able to order food and say hello. If you're only having those conversations, your language skills will stagnate at that level. Um, you need to be in an environment where the languages are valued. If a ch language is not valued, children will find any way possible to get out of using that language and developing it. We need to have sustained and regular exposure to a language. And ideally, we'd love to have 50% exposure to one language and 50% to the other, but that's not necessary. As long as we have about 30% exposure to a language, we will become creative and um, develop skills in that language. We used to say one parent, one language. Don't confuse the child, keep the languages separate. We now know that that's not necessary. We also know that no one was able to do that. While parents told us, you know, yes, yes, I only speak. And I, first one, I'd always say to everyone, I only speak English with my boys. Not true. I mix a lot, and most parents do, and it's very hard um, to avoid doing that. Um, and as well, when we're talking about children's literacy skills, they need to have received some formal literacy instruction in order to perform within normal limits. So they will transfer a lot of the skills, but if you're testing them on normalized tests, they need to have received that instruction. 
And we have to, so we need certain basic requirements, but we also have to be aware of certain myths about bilingualism, and I'd like to address some of these. The first one is that children soak up new languages like a sponge. We'll see. Um, the second is that earlier is always better when it comes to language learning. And the third is that bilingual acquisition will inevitably result in linguistic confusion, and linguistic confusion is manifested by code switching or code mixing. So the sponge issue. Well, we know that, in fact, children, if we're talking about a child who doesn't speak the language of schooling before starting school, we know now that they need about two to three years before they master conversational skills. That's a lot more than most people would think. And when it comes to academic skills, five to seven years is what they need to perform exactly like the monolingual children. So not so much a sponge as we thought. And there are large individual differences from one child to another. Some children are very quick at mastering uh, certain aspects of language, and others it takes them more time. So it's hard to pinpoint if a child is having difficulty because of that broad variation. Also, the same child can have a variation um, in the different linguistic domains. So the child can be doing very well in terms of vocabulary development within normal limits, but the grammatical skills are not yet on par with monolingual children. And that's normal, not a sign of impairment. Is earlier always better? Well, generally, yes, earlier is better, but not if the language environment is suboptimal. So if you have a Hungarian family, for example, who does not master English or French, having them start speaking to their child in English or in French to prepare the child for school entry is not a good idea. Because what's most important is to provide the richest language input possible. So if you're uh, not mastering a language, it's difficult for you to do more uh, sophisticated things with language, like predicting what's going to happen next in a story, or comparing one story with another, or um, trying to compare a story in terms of the sequence with it, like very higher level language skills. And that's what's important, to play rhyming games, to talk about how words uh, look like in written language, how they sound alike. We also know now that children who have high-level language skills in their first language will tend to do better academically in their second language later on. There is robust research evidence demonstrating this. And um, furthermore, if you go as far as to teach your child to read in your language, that as well will facilitate written language instruction in the second language for your child. So there's a lot of research evidence out there suggesting to just continue using your native language with your child. Now, about um, causing confusion. So we know that children code mix a lot. Adults code mix a lot. We mix languages when we speak. There are two types of code mixing. Intra-utterance, so a child who says something like big autobus, or inter-utterance. So a mother is saying, where would you like to go? And the child says, au parc. And the mother says, should we bring some toys? And the child says, yes, my soccer ball. So he's switching between utterances. When it comes to code switching, also known as code mixing, we know that children do three things. The first one is that they tend to use a word from another language when they don't have the translation equivalent. So it's a strategy. They're saying, I don't know how to say this word to you. I'm going to say it in my other language, and hopefully you will understand that. It's not that they're confused. Most of the time, it's because they just cannot. This graph is showing just two children doing this, but um, we have these results for numerous children. Another thing that children and adults do is they mirror what's going on in their environment. So this graph is showing different children that are code switching to a similar percentage as their mom. So if the mom code switches more, the child code switches more. And we do this between ourselves. If I speak to someone here who's using a lot of French when speaking English, I'll go right along with that and continue doing that. So it's not abnormal. But sometimes we see that in a child and we say, oh, he's confused. Look at what he's doing. But we do the same thing. Furthermore, what we know about children and code switching and adults is that we tend to do this in a way that respects the grammatical constraints of each language. So in this study, they analyzed over 10,000 utterances of preschoolers who are bilingual. There were 429 mixed or code switching utterances. 
Of those 429, 99.3% of the time, the children were respecting the grammatical constraints of both, um, I forgot to say this is French and English, the children were respecting the constraints of both French and English. So they were saying something like the big maison. So in French, we would say la grande maison, and in English, we would say the big house, determiner, adjective, noun, in both languages. And only 0.7% of the time, less than 1% of the time, did they violate the constraints of one of the languages by saying something like, my rose bat. So in English, we would say, my pink bat. In French, we would say, mon baton rose. So the adjective would be in a different position. So this shows us, again, that the children are not confused. They're actually quite smart when it comes to language. And subconsciously, they're aware of all of these grammatical rules. So the implications of this is that we should not panic when we see code switching. We should reassure parents and be reassured as parents when this is going on. It's not a sign of linguistic confusion or of impairment. Now what about kids who struggle with language? This is sort of where we tend to go, wait, put on the brakes, I don't know about this bilingualism thing, this child is struggling. So firstly, um, a look at children who have primary language impairment. So language impairment is a type of language difficulty that is lifelong, it persists over time. The child will make gains, but the difficulty with language will always be there. We know that across languages, Children tend to struggle more with grammatical elements when they have language impairment, and even more particularly with um, structures that affect tense across the languages. This is a study that was done in Montreal by Joanne Paradis, Martha Crago, Fred Genesee, and Mabel Rice, where they looked at bilingual children, French-English children who were raised bilingually at home. These children were between six and seven years of age, and the authors compared the abilities of these bilingual children with language impairment to monolingual children with language impairment. And what they found was that there were no significant differences between the French language skills of the bilingual children with language impairment and the French language skills of monolingual children with language impairment, and similarly for the English. So in both cases, the children struggled more with tense morphemes than with non-tense morphemes. So tense would be something like the past tense or the third person present tense, he eats, that S marker. And non-tense morphemes are things like the plural, two balls. So again, it's the, the, the same um, sound, but used differently. And so what they conclude from this is that the bilingual children are not disadvantaged in any way. They're not more severely impaired, and they don't have different profiles when they're bilingual. This study um, did pretty much the same thing, but with English-Spanish children. And again, they compared bilingual children with language impairment to monolingual children with language impairment. And again, they found that the children were not significantly different. They struggled with the same aspects. They struggled with tense in this study as well, uh, but they did not struggle more than the monolingual children. So again, so far, no research evidence suggesting that bilingualism exacerbates language difficulties. This is a study that was done by Maggie Bruck. You may remember her. She was a psychologist affiliated with the children's many years ago. She looked at children in French immersion programs, the children with language impairment, and she compared them to children in the monolingual English streams, also with language impairment, and wanted to see what about, you know, when not children who are raised bilingually, but children who become bilingual through schooling. Does the picture change for those children? And what she found was that on measures of vocabulary, abstract reasoning, grammar, visual skills, auditory skills, academic achievement, and reading and spelling, by grade three, the children with language impairment in the bilingual programs did not differ significantly from the children with language impairment in the monolingual programs. So even in bilingualism through schooling, there is no research evidence suggesting that we should say to parents, your child should probably go in the regular stream. So this is an old study, mind you, where we don't have huge numbers or a huge number of studies in the area of a language impairment, but what's out there is giving a consistent message. Now, what about other developmental disorders? Maybe the limit is when you're talking about language impairment. Maybe then bilingualism is too much. 
so this is another study done in Montreal. I love Montreal for all of these <laughs> bilingualism studies. Um, this is Ellen Thor, the daughter, and Natasha Trudeau, so people from McGill, Invest in Montreal, Dalhousie, looking at children aged between 20 and 47 months of age, mental age, children with Down syndrome who were either raised bilingually or in monolingual settings. The authors looked at um, receptive language measures, expressive language measures, and very um, psychometrically sound tests, the preschool language scale. They looked also at the vocabulary on the MacArthur CDI. Um, they looked at the mean length of utterance, so the average length of the sentences produced by the children. And in all measures, the monolingual children with Down syndrome did not differ, or rather the bilingual children with Down syndrome did not differ significantly as compared to the monolingual children with Down syndrome. So even in the case of intellectual impairment, it looks like we can go ahead and, and not be worried that the bilingualism will make their uh, language difficulties worse. And this was interesting because children with Down syndrome also have language difficulties, but their language difficulties are different from children with primary language impairment. They tend to have a strength in the area of uh, vocabulary for most children and particular weaknesses as well in grammar, though. And then myself, I was always thinking, okay, but maybe autism, maybe that's the limit because autistic children, you know, have difficulty relating to others and that's how we learn language. We're, we're exchanging with others on a continuous basis. So maybe that's the, I don't know, the bemol in terms of raising children bilingually. So thankfully, there's a flurry of studies that came out recently looking at children with autism. In this study by uh, our own Catherine Hambly and Dr. Fonbon, uh, Montreal study, children were compared either monolingual children, bilingual children, or trilingual children with autism spectrum disorders. And they looked at simultaneous versus sequential bilingualism because we know that parents will change their decisions about languages when they notice their child's having a difficulty. So they may be raising the child bilingually and then they notice something's not, something's off about the child's development and they'll eliminate a language. So they considered that in the study, which I thought was kind of neat. The children were from a variety of language backgrounds. They included nonverbal children, not to bias uh, the study. And they compared the children, however, they didn't assess cognitive ability, but they compared the children on the severity of their autism, their social skills, receptive language, expressive language, and their vocabulary. And essentially, I'm sorry, this is very small, but um, there were no significant differences except that the children who were raised um, as simultaneous bilinguals were more advanced in terms of social skills. So telling us that parents are more at ease to raise their children bilingually if the children seem to be doing better. But in terms of the language measures and the severity of autism, no significant difference between the two populations, two samples. This is another study done by the Pathways in ASD study team, a long list of researchers involved in this, where um, the children uh, were compared, they were either monolingual or simultaneous bilingual children. They all had French or English as a first language and they spoke a variety of second languages. In this study and in the next one, they um, only include children who have at least 30 words, which I, I don't understand completely. They, they state in both articles that it's because it's at this stage that children start acquiring verbs and not just nouns. So I, I take it that they were interested in looking at the age of word combinations as a major point in their study, and that's why they did this. Um, the children were matched for age and nonverbal IQ. They were compared with respect to therapy received. And they looked at the similar variables, severity of autism, first words, the age of first words, age of first phrases, overall receptive language, overall expressive language, and functional communication. And again, there were no significant differences between the children who were raised bilingually with autism spectrum disorder and the children who were raised monolingually. And this is uh, the last study of children with autism spectrum disorders. This one uh, I thought was... Uh, great because all the children had Chinese as a first language and English as a second language. So now we're controlling the languages. Um, the children were matched for age, nonverbal IQ was controlled. Again, they took into consideration the amount of therapy received by these children. And they um, compared them on receptive vocabulary, expressive vocabulary, receptive language overall, and expressive language overall. 
And again, there were no significant differences. We do see a difference there in terms of the total vocabulary score because they uh, counted each word. They didn't look at total conceptual vocabulary, but said, okay, you have chien, you have dog, two vocabulary words. And that's why there's a significant difference there in vocabulary for the bilingual children. But um, fundamentally then, there was no evidence in this study either of bilingualism exacerbating the children's uh, profiles or language difficulties. And so the message then is for all of these children, language impairment, Down syndrome, autism spectrum disorder, the children struggle to the same extent and they have the same profiles, whether they're bilingual or monolingual. But if you're talking about raising a child bilingually, there are some things that have to be kept in mind. Is it feasible to sustain this child's exposure to both languages? You need to think it through. If you're planning um, changes whereby it won't be feasible, that's important to consider. Um, is there an upcoming move? Are you moving to Toronto? And if so, well, maybe French won't be needed as, needed as much, and maybe you can focus on the two other languages. So you need to think about those things and invest in raising a child bilingually. <coughs> also, you need to think about the support that you can offer a child in terms of schooling. If you have an option for language of schooling and you can decide that, then you need to think about, can I support my child if he goes in French to French school and my child has difficulty? Those are the kinds of questions you need to ask. So it's not about the child's capacities now, it's about the environment and the environment's capacity to support that child in the languages. Assuming that you have control over that and we don't always hear. And I'd like to end with this. So if you're not convinced by that, <laughs> I have some additional reading here for you if you want to look into this further. And of course, you can always contact me. I'm more than happy to answer questions. And I'll be in the 2B area giving out coffee and cookies for the next little while. So feel free to drop by. But I'll take questions now if there are any. Thank you very much, Carol. Okay. Oh, one time. Are there any questions at our other sites at RVH? Or? No. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Dr. I'm I'll sorry. Go no, 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 no. <laughs> Thanks very much, Carolyn. That was great. Um, I think I might have asked you this question before, but I'm going to ask it again because I'm still not sure how to figure this out. We have so many families who uh, will are, are uh, immigrant families whose second language is English, whose third language with great difficulty may be French or no French at all, and they have to send their kids to French school, <coughs> monolingual French school. Uh, how do we help those parents to help their kids? Because they really are in a very disadvantaged position uh, to be able to help their kids with uh, with, with school at all. Mm -hmm. um, I know the best is for them to learn the language, but it, they, you know, it's, it's not As realistic. As I said, that though, they the best learn. thing they can do for their child is provide rich input in their first language because a lot of that will carry over. If they teach their child about story structure, so a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, by telling stories, you learn this, right? There's some sort of a precipitating event, there's conflict resolution. Once a child knows that, that facilitates his language comprehension in French or in English. He Studies have shown that if you understand story structure, you understand what you read 
and if the narrative has that similar profile, better. So that will help the child. They need to continue. So we need to teach them how to provide rich input. We need to say to them, here's what you can do with your child, and here's how you can have them listen to words. Oh, this child, this word sounds starts with p, and that word starts with p. So to go beyond just give me this, do that, come here, to spend time enriching the child's language, that's a big plus. The other thing, they need to look for individuals who can help support the child. So in the community, through their library programs, Programs. They need to find someone who can help the child. Ask the school if there are older peers who can uh, sit with this child a few hours a week. That's done at the Armenian school I'm at, and it works very well. A grade six child with a grade one child going over homework, and it's not, you know, a professional sitting with the child. But the impact studies have shown that that's beneficial in terms of reading skills, spelling. There are different things that can be done that way as well. Any other questions? Thanks for telling me everything that I did wrong with my own children. <laughs> despite which they're fluently trilingual. Um, my question is about the uh, autism studies. I noticed that some of these uh, kids were as young as 24 months old, and I'm wondering how solid can the diagnosis of autism be at this young age? Yes. You're, you're, did I understand correctly? You're asking about when they get older? No, sorry. No, no, how sure can you be that this 24 months old have? How sure can you be that this 24 months old have autism? It, mm. it's, it's a too, in my mind, it's too early an age to make this diagnosis. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. But in these cases, they were using um, the authors only included children who had received a diagnosis by a specialized team. Um, so I trusted the diagnosis, but the, it's true that maybe some of the, we know these children sometimes change over time and we can see a very different picture at another time point. That's a good point. Um, can I just mention, because I was part of the, of the study in autism, so these are all children who are diagnosed at age two, but they're followed up over time. It's a longitudinal study, so they maintain their diagnosis. And actually, the, the diagnosis is pretty stable between two and a half, three years old. It tends to be like 85% stable over time if diagnosed in a specialized clinic using standardized tools and all that. And most of these children have maintained their diagnosis over time. Okay, great. Thank you for adding that. Hi, good morning. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, have you noticed if there is an, any, any more difficult or more easier for a child raised in both a uh, Latin derived language, for example, English, uh, Spanish, and French, for example? It would be easier for the for the children learn both languages, or actually it's going to be difficult because there is a, a lot of similarities among these two languages. I think that it would be easier, and in fact, there are studies showing that the closer the languages are, the easier it is to pick up that language. So I know that there are sort of false cognates and things that come and play and confuse us when the languages are similar, but that transfer can really be capitalized on in terms of a lot of the skills don't need to be retaught because they're so similar. But overall, it's a plus. As a new child. Oh, hello. Mm-hmm. Ah. Thank you, Caroline. It was a great presentation. Now, the question is, how are you going to get these findings to the schools? There are still schools today that will recommend to switch out yes. of, like even this year, yes. to switch out of the uh, bilingual program or from the French immersion into the English one. I know. People can't stay away from making that recommendation. It's but it's harmful for the children in some ways. It is, yes. absolutely. And you know, if, if my child is going to be limited in terms of some of his abilities, I'm not going to further limit him by rendering him monolingual, you know. So I understand we're trying to get the message out. The evidence is out there. It's been out there for a long time. I give presentations every time I'm asked. I don't think I've ever turned down, nor mm -hmm. have my colleagues who produce this research. I don't know. I, I always think it's going to take one very angry family to, you know, get this <laughs> out there and yeah. do something about it. Thank you.
Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. Just um, my question is about speci specifically the, the kids who have uh, difficulties for expressive or receptive language. How many languages should we have a match? Is bilingual good, but trilingual? Sometimes we have families with five, six, seven yeah. languages. So is as I a, said at the beginning, uh, we, there's a lot less research on children who are exposed to more than two languages. And we also, however, though, have, and, and the research that we do have tends to send the same message that it's fine for children to be exposed to these languages. But we know that input is very important. And below a certain percentage of input, and that appears to be about 40%, we can't expect them to be as proficient as monolingual children. So that comes into play. And then it becomes more difficult to evaluate them and to try and identify if it's a language disorder or just incomplete second language acquisition. So the risk is in terms of identification. And if, but if you don't need that piece and you're in a setting where they're going to give help, as long as there's an issue, then that doesn't matter. Bonjour Caroline, merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. Moi, je voudrais savoir, euh, dans le bilinguisme qu'on voit, est-ce que les sons transfèrent aussi? Est-ce que les difficultés, par exemple, l'anglais et le français, les TH, the third, les différents sons, est-ce qu'ils transfèrent aussi dans ce bilinguisme? Est-ce que l'accent va changer? Ce qu'on voit dans les recherches, c'est que... Should I answer in French or in English? Okay. Ah, in both. Let's do a little bit of French. Donc, les recherches nous démontrent que le plus qu'on apprend une langue tard, le moins qu'on va perdre l'accent. Donc, ces subtilités-là vont être difficiles pour nous d'entendre la différence entre le T et le TH, par exemple, le plus que plus tard qu'il est dans notre développement quand on apprend cette langue-là. Je ne sais pas si ça répond à votre question. Si on l'apprend tôt, ça va transférer et on va être capable d'entendre et de produire ces distinctions-là. Mais en vieillissant, parfois, c'est plus difficile. Um, I just wanted to get back to the uh, recommendations you could give to families about what they can do if they can't provide that 30 to 40 percent support mm -hmm. themselves. Um, would recommending some social activities like Absolutely. scouts or clubs, exactly. or, they exactly. don't have to have instruction necessarily, no. it's being exactly. exposed. Exactly, and I didn't address that. Way. So when parents are really keen to get started on the language of schooling, then they should not be doing that themselves, but they should find extracurricular activities, reading groups at the library, soccer, swimming in another language, getting the child exposed to children who speak that language and finding that input, exactly. But it's hard work. You, know, you need to really invest and think, okay, I'm, I'm going to sign up for this sport rather than that one because of that language. I'm going to put um, books on CD in French to expose my child to French. So there are other ways to do this, but it involves more thought. You need to change your routine sometimes and make conscious decisions. Yes. This is a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. I just have one question that maybe it's a little bit silly, but um, what do I tell parents that tell me that uh, their child has learned uh, a language from watching TV? Mm. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or to add another dimension, the parent will say, but my ch for my child, English is just a lot easier than French. He's just not picking up on the French, he's picking up on the English. So there's motivation there. So let me just address the TV issue. So we know that children um, don't pick up a lot from TV at all. They tend to look and, and pay attention, but the language is not being built a lot in most cases, unless you have something that's highly interactive and highly engaging. Like um, Margie Golick was very involved in Sesame Street. She was part of their group, and they did a lot of studies looking at that. And in that case, children were picking up on some of the language. But most of the shows out there are not like that. So uh, I would recommend that they not put too much emphasis on that, because it's not going to bring them very far. Yeah. I <clears throat> very much appreciate your presentation. It's uh, reassuring, to say the least, to know that uh, bilingual environments are a good uh, component of learning for a child. But I think you touched on it briefly, but I think in my own experience, motivation is super critical. That no matter how hard you try to create the right environment, unless the child recognizes the value of learning more than one language, it's going to be very difficult. And equally, if the alphabet is different 
uh, between one language and the other. I have twin grandsons who are learning Mandarin in Hong Kong, but they're living in an English language environment. They've been working at this for the better part of 15 years, <laughs> but it's still a struggle for them. Yes. Uh, you're, so on both of those points, you're absolutely right. With the motivation, it's very, very important. And some parents don't realize. Some parents have told me, my child's just not interested in l learning French. In some cases, they've picked up on that from the parent. So the parent is very um, put off by having to learn French, and it's transferring over to the child. When children are motivated in the right way, usually they want to learn languages. But there are some places that go about it in a way that's questionable. You know, I remember um, doing my PhD in a school where the children had necklaces with beads on them. And one child had just one bead on his necklace. And I said, oh, I said, your necklace only has one bead. And he said, yes. He said, I lose a bead each time I speak English. <laughs> so not a great way to motivate a child to speak French, you know? In terms of the alphabets, though, the good news is that the underlying structures, so the phonological awareness that you need to learn to read a language, for example, does transfer over across languages. So if your sons have well-developed precursors to literacy, that will transfer from English to Cantonese or to Mandarin, and we do have research evidence of that. So there's still transfer, even though those languages may seem very, very different. Sorry, might not be coming out right, but I mean, we focused a lot on exposure to verbal language. How much contribution does exposure to reading in both languages could contribute to the vocabulary skills of, of these children? I mean, you know, let's say you not necessarily choosing a book, they will pick up the one that they want, and you'd have both choices in the same household. Would that actually improve their vocabulary and literacy skills? I love that you said that right at the end because we can link to our literacy program and how when we read to children, we, well, I'm going to pay you after. <laughs> So when we read to children, we know that we can expose them to vocabulary that they would rarely be exposed to in spoken conversation and much richer vocabulary. So that plays a big role. If you can do that, if you master both languages and you can go for a book in another language, then you're building that child's vocabulary. And we know that vocabulary is very closely linked to school success and all the great things about having a rich vocabulary. So it plays a very important role. Literacy gives us access to sentence structures and vocabulary that we don't otherwise come across as frequently. Are there any more questions? Very good. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.